Hello and welcome everyone to another YouTube uh, workshop live here at Tree of Life. We have with us Annika Neighbors uh, with the UC Cooperative Extension in San Diego and she's going to bring us a well, um, excellent presentation. We've done this once before last year when we gave our first round of results. Uh, but Annika, welcome and thank you again meeting with us and uh, a little bit about this, we are going to give, Annika is going to give a presentation on uh, native plants and pollinator interactions and some of the research she has been doing here at Tree of Life. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, we're going to take you on a pre-recorded tour of the research plots themselves. So hello, Annika. Good morning. And, Hi, uh, how's it going? You're doing well. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to be talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, as as some of as some of the more uh, dedicated Tree of Life visitors might know, um, I've been doing research at the Tree of Life Nursery for uh, coming up on well, this this is our third year now that that we're into, um, and uh, basically what what the well, we'll we'll get into the nitty gritty of the research later. But um, basically, I am a pollination ecologist, so I look at the relationship between plants and the insects that visit them, and kind of dig into the, the details of the science on that. Um, and I'm with the UC Cooperative Extension San Diego. Um, Cooperative Extension is a great resource for if you have any gardening questions, pest control, um, uh, food preservation, uh, home finance. It's kind of ev everything to do with uh, like your home and your garden and, and agriculture. And, and we do a lot of research to try to help out um, uh, agricultural and horticultural uh, businesses as well uh, throughout the county and in Orange County as well. So uh, looking forward to getting into the details of the research that we've been doing in collaboration with Tree of Life. Excellent. So uh, yeah, uh, let's, without further ado, we've done some, this is what, the third year, second year, second year of research here? Uh, no, yeah, this is actually the third year. Um, the, the, the research that I'll be describing has only data from 2018 2019. Um, we're still collecting data this year, but of course we're in the middle of the field season. So we can't, uh, we have to kind of put everything aside and run it through the number cruncher and, and figure out what's, what's really going on before we can talk about it. But uh, definitely this is our third year. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, without further ado, why don't you give us a little bit of background and uh, looking forward to this presentation. All right, awesome. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, before we dive into the details on this research, I'm gonna give you all a little talk about uh, what pollinators are and kind of why they're important. Um, little little po pollinator 101. Um, so let me get going with this screen sharing here. Okay, thank you everyone for your patience because this is the first uh, Zoom live, uh, live webinar that I've done and hopefully we can uh, all be on the same page. All right. So, are are we seeing the are we seeing the presentation? Is everyone seeing that? Does that look good, Kevin? Uh, yes, it looks like it. Perfect. All right. Okay. So, uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, as I talk, talked a little bit about before, uh, this talk is going to be about native pollinators, their biology, their behavior, <laughs> and the plants that they love or avoid. Um, and as I said before, cooperative extension, all that good stuff. Um, so uh, before we can talk about uh, all, the, all the details of, of uh, native pollinators and plants, we have to talk about, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, what is a pollinator? Is everyone, I'm, I'm getting a little bit of uh, buzziness there. Can everyone see that? The screen sharing button isn't in the way. Everyone's good? All right. Okay, what is a pollinator? Uh, essentially, uh, pollinators are animals that move pollen from male flower parts to female flower parts, helping plants reproduce. Um, typically people think of like, oh, honeybees, you know, save the bees. Um, they're kind of charismatic, they're cute, they're publicly familiar. People know about the wiggle dance that they do to uh, communicate where resources are. Um, but it's actually more than just bees. Um, bees, wasps, flies, butterflies and moths, basically any insect that you can think of more or less, anything that lands on a flower. Um, and even vertebrates like birds, bats, rodents, and lizards, anything that can feed on the nectar resources of a flower or the pollen resources of a flower um, can transmit that pollen. Um, so I will primarily be talking about bees today since that, that's my major uh, area of knowledge and, and area of expertise. Um, but just keep in mind that pollinators can be anything. If I say bees, that doesn't mean that it only has to be bees. 
Um, and of course, um, most important of all, they're crucial for ecosystem health and biodiversity. Um, even just for human uh, resources and agriculture, um, the Xerces Society did a study that showed that one out of every three bites of food that a person eats throughout the day is actually uh, is would not exist without without pollination. Um, so you can imagine that that the grocery shelves would be a lot more empty without pollinators in the work they do. For example, blueberries, tomatoes, almonds, uh, sunflowers. You can you get the gist. Um, so as I said, when we think of a bee, uh, we often think of honeybees. You know, yellow and black uh, live in colonies, have this sort of eusocial social lifestyle. Um, and of course, uh, honeybees are quite well known, but as a matter of fact, they've only been in California for less than 200 years. Uh, they're actually native to uh, Mediterranean Europe and the Middle East and Northern Africa. Um, they're super generalists. They are super adaptable. Um, as I mentioned before with the waggle dance, um, they recruit foragers to plant resources, which is part of why they're so uh, competitively successful because instead of just being kind of one animal looking for resources on its own, they can actually recruit in these sort of large numbers to a very uh, uh, resource rich uh, fl floral area. So they, they can collect uh, nectar and pollen better in that way. Um, believe it or not, even though they're this um, non-native species that's been introduced in California relatively new, um, they actually make up 85 to 95% of visitors to many Southern California native plant species. Um, and this is even in, even in kind of wildlands, even in uh, really undisturbed natural habitat, um, these honeybees are super numerically dominant in our ecosystem. Now, on the other hand, um, you've got native bees. Um, as you can just see from this, from this brief capture, um, they come in all different shapes and sizes, all different colors and designs. Um, and I can only speak for San Diego County because that's where a majority of the Southern California bee work has been done. Um, but there are over 700 species of native bees in San Diego County alone. And I'm sure a lot of those overlap into OC as well. Um, and whereas honeybees are highly generalist and uh, highly adaptable to any different type of uh, foraging environment, um, native bees are all over the map. There are some that are hyper generalists. There are some that are specialists. There are some that are extreme specialists. They'll only visit um, one genus or one species of plant, or maybe a few a few species in one family. Um, and uh, unlike our native bees, um, they are actually high. Excuse me. Unlike our honeybees, uh, they're actually highly affected by habitat loss, uh, much like any other wild animal. Um, they need. Uh, varying amounts of intact ecosystem and in some cases, in the case of specialists, the plants that they evolved with in order to use those resources. Um, so honeybees, uh, of course, are kept domestically, um, but also um, often become feral uh, due to their reproductive habit of swarming. Um, whereas native bees uh, don't have that kind of benefit of being kept domestically in those large numbers. So, uh, as I discussed before, uh, pollinating insects are highly diverse, uh, not just bees. Uh, you can see a, a, short, a short clip of all of the different types of things that you can see um, that, that might visit uh, flowers. Um, on the left uh, in that California poppy, we've got a surfid fly and a little beetle, uh, both visiting at the same time. Then moving left to right, we've got another surfid fly. Uh, we've got a, a shiny green helicted sweat bee. Um, and then a little moth on the right. And then in that upper right-hand corner, that's a painted lady butterfly. Um, I was speaking a bit earlier about generalists and specialists. Um, that might seem like a specialized terminology, but basically a generalist is one species of pollinator that can visit many species or groups of plants and use those resources. It doesn't really need any one particular type of nectar, type of pollen, um, shape of flower, that kind of thing. Whereas specialists are some that visit just one or just one group of plants. Um, and of course their uh, evolutionary fate is much more intertwined with that species. Um, and because pollinating insects are so crucial to uh, plant re to many plants reproduction, um, as insects evolve, so flowers evolve and vice versa. Um, they have this really complex, um, often over hundreds, tens or hundreds of millions of years, um, inter-evolved relationship where uh, as, the, as the pollinator develops uh, certain, you know, body, uh, body morphologies or behavioral adaptations, uh, the flower will as well and vice versa. 
Um, so here's just a couple examples. Um, hummingbirds love to visit long, thin flowers. Uh, they also like red because vertebrate eyes can see uh, better on the redder end of the spectrum, whereas insect eyes generally uh, start seeing color at around orangish, yellowish. Um, on the upper right, we have a bumblebee performing buzz pollination. Um, and bumblebees are pretty special in this. Uh, they, they share this with uh, blueberries, I think, or excuse me, um, they, they share, they share this, this thing with buzz pollination. Um, both senna and uh, blueberries need buzz pollination. Basically bumblebees um, and carpenter bees can do this special thing where they vibrate their thoracic wing muscles um, in order to shake loose as much pollen as possible. And uh, some, some plants will not pollinate and will not reproduce uh, without that special uh, wing vibration. So that's, that's something that bumblebees bring to the table. Um, then moving down on the lower right, uh, we can actually see that, believe it or not, is not a bee. It's actually a fly. Um, it is a bee mimic fly in the bombaleid family, which means bumblebee-like family. Um, and it has a long tongue, which is of course adapted to allow it to sip from these kind of long thin flowers. Um, and then on the lower left, uh, we have a tiny little bee visiting tiny little flowers. I don't know if you can tell, but that little bee is about five millimeters long, which is um, probably about the width of my pinky finger. So very small, really not what you think of when you think of a bee. Um, but of course, it's perfectly adapted to visit and forage on those teeny little flowers. Um, so you can see that, of, of course, you know, every day we see the vast difference in floral morphology just walking around our garden or walking around uh, you know, like a park or something like that. Um, but the pollinators have this vast difference in body morphology as well. And not only body morphology, um, they also have behavioral and foraging adaptations. Um, so pollinators can vary widely. Um, they, can, they, they might be able to fly up to five kilometers, um, the, the, the bigger bodied ones, uh, to be able to look for different flowers. Um, They'll often partition uh, which time of the day that different, different species would like to visit. Um, for example, uh, some bees specialize in very early mornings in the desert before the sun rises, um, because that is the, that's the sort of evolutionary niche, if you will, that allows them to uh, get the advantage of that pollen before someone else takes it away from them. Um, they also have differences in floral fidelity. So if you, if, if a bee visits the same, let's say that it's bopping around a field where there's all different wildflowers. Um, if it visits this 10 individuals of the same flower species in a row, that that's extremely high floral fidelity. And the plant would also prefer that in an evolutionary sense, because it's much more likely to receive the correct type of pollen, um, because the bee had visited, uh, the similar species beforehand. Uh, uh, a pollinator with extremely low floral fidelity um, would just visit whichever plant that it chose to at random and not have as high floral fidelity. And that is a different behavioral adaptation as well. Um, as I said before, buzz pollination um, is another type of foraging behavior. Uh, honeybees have a very methodical foraging type. You know, if you've heard of the term of like a bee line, they'll just make a bee line to whatever resource they think is the best and just kind of methodically strip it of its of its pollen and nectar. Um, oh, and nectar thievery, that's fun. We're not gonna get too far down the rabbit hole here of all the different foraging behaviors that, that different pollinators have. Um, but nectar thievery is actually a, a pretty sneaky little trick that a lot of, a lot of bees and other pollinators will often do uh, where they, if, if you imagine the tube of a flower, um, the, the corolla here, um, imagine that instead of going into the front of a flower, like you normally would, um, if you, if you bite a hole through the side of the flower, uh, you'll actually be able to suck that nectar and, and get that advantage without even contacting, uh, the anther or the pollen producing parts at all. So pretty sneaky, um, but definitely a good adaptation if you want to just get nectar real quick. <laughs> um, so you can see that that foraging behavior uh, differs widely as well. Um, and if we're talking about uh, native plants that have evolved in a certain area, uh, many of them rely on animal pollination and they actually suffer reproductively when native pollinators are removed, even when honeybees are abundant. Um, as I was saying before, a lot of these plants are specialists, which means that they need for example, with the buzz pollination, they need a certain type of pollination. Um, they need uh, certain types of visitors that, that, that honeybees might not be similar to, you know, with different body size, different foraging methodology, all that kind of thing. Um, even when honeybees are abundant, um, 
they can often overwhelm floral resources and remove the lion's share of pollen and nectar. Remember that 85 to 95% figure that we talked about? Um, when you have 90% honeybees visiting a plant that up until 200 years ago had evolved to only be pollinated and visited by uh, you know, the, the pollinators that were already sort of there present in the landscape, um, that really changes the uh, pollen flow dynamics and overall the, the plant reproductive uh, uh, landscape of, of the ecology of that area. Um, and of course, uh, native bees, even on their own, of course, every, every, uh, every type of wildlife is worth protecting on its own merits, um, even, if, even if they didn't provide these awesome pollination services to the plants that we know and love. Um, one really important way that we can help uh, protect and encourage native bees is by gardening with plants that provide floral resources to those bees. Um, this is one reason why we were performing this research to see what types of plants um, are most attractive to these native pollinators and uh, what, um, what types of resources can be are, are sort of preferentially uh, provided to these pollinators. Um, so let's say that uh, let's just 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 keep in mind that this is kind of a, a, a rough a rough sort of simplification. Um, but let's say that on the upper left hand corner, um, we've got kind of a, a wilderness area, you know, undeveloped. There's a lot of habitat for native bees and native pollinators. Um, that's what we would call kind of like the, the original area. Um, and let's say that uh, Let's say that the only two the only two areas were this kind of upper left green corner here, which is kind of like the undeveloped area, and then this lower right corner, um, which you can see, you know, doesn't doesn't really have anything in it. Um, however, uh, because bees are so mobile, bees and other pollinators, uh, because they're so mobile, they can actually use this concept of stepping stones, um, or if, if anyone's ever heard of wildlife corridors, it's a similar type of concept. Um, Essentially, uh, you can see with these little red arrows moving back and forth, um, these native gardens or gardens that, uh, you know, have been managed with uh, maintaining uh, wildlife diversity in mind, uh, they can actually act as stepping stones. Um, and uh, the, the bees up in this uh, left-hand reserve up here, um, you know, perhaps a bee couldn't fly uh, all the way to that lower right-hand green area, but perhaps it could fly to that first little stepping stone. And then, uh, you know, reproduces, does its thing for a year, and then it could fly to the next one, or the descendants could fly to the next one. Then, you know, uh, a, a couple years later, they can move back and forth, and then, boom, you have that species in this new reserve, and um, they can, uh, there, there can be gene flow, there can be remixing, and, and uh, native species that have been extirpated in an area can actually recolonize um, because of these little pockets of biodiversity that have been created uh, with, with uh, appropriate resources for native pollinators. Um, so as to, to, kind of, to kind of bring all that to a, to a conclusion, um, conserving biodiversity isn't just about huge nature reserves. It's about man maintaining natural habitats, no matter how small, um, for the smallest organisms that make up the fabric of life. Um, and of course, a mountain lion needs a huge territory uh, to, in order to, to preserve its, it as a species. Uh, bees really don't need that much and they, they don't really need too many resources either. They can, they can really get their, their, their little claws in anywhere. Um, so uh, there is a problem with that, however. Very few people have studied floral visitation on ornamental plants, especially not in Southern California. Um, oftentimes when you see these lists of like, here, here's what to plant in your butterfly garden, here's what to plant to save the bees. Um, those lists are often compiled uh, without regard for the area that someone's living in, um, the, the type of habitat that's native in that area, or even whether that whether bees or, or native pollinators even like to visit that plant in the first place. Generally, there's these kind of lists that are sort of passed down like, oh, everyone knows that butterfly bush is good for butterflies and blah, blah, blah. Um, but quantifying uh, the visitation to these species uh, is a great way to actually get scientific data and make your choices uh, for to kind of have, have your sort of native garden um, that has been uh, scientifically supported, if that makes sense. Um, and of course, Southern California, um, as we all know, uh, living here is, is completely gorgeous and it has a really unique, uh, it has a really unique uh, collection of biodiversity and, and collection of plants and animals. Um, 
And it's pretty unusual because it has this both, you know, kind of global biodiversity hotspot status. Um, there are tons of endemic endangered species here, um, stuff that's found nowhere else. Um, but it's also unusual in that it's very highly urbanized and highly developed. Um, Orange County is actually one of the most developed counties in California in terms of uh, land acreage. Um, and yet uh, Orange County is, you know, highly, highly biodiverse as well. Um, so it's really important to remember that when we're making choices about what to plant in our native garden, that we use these kind of scientifically, scientifically backed up things because um, not to be dramatic, but because the stakes are so high, because there's so much amazing biodiversity here that really doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, so here, so time to get into the nitty gritty of the research. Um, basically, uh, this part of the project had two phases. Um, first, we observed plants, and second, we collected specimens. Plant observation is basically just what it sounds like. You pick a bunch of plants that are commonly used in landscaping, you plop yourself down next to them and you just wait for bugs to come and, and write down what comes. Um, to have a little bit more accuracy and uh, sort of scientific specificity on what specimens are what, um, we also hand collected specimens um, and looked at them under the microscope afterwards. Of course, you can imagine a little bee kind of zooming by for two seconds. Um, you don't get it quite as accurate of an identification as you would if you sat down with it under a microscope. Um, Yes, uh, specimen collection is essential, um, both to identify them accurately and to quantify uh, which visitors are visiting which plant species um, more accurately. Um, you can see on the left here, we've got a lot of different species of bumblebees. Um, San Diego County in Southern California actually is not as rich in bumblebee diversity as some areas, but we definitely still do have a lot. Um, let's say that you see it zooming by for two seconds. You're like, oh, it was fuzzy. It was black and yellow, it had stripes. That's definitely an identification, you know, it's better than nothing, but uh, you could be a little bit more precise. You could say some bumblebees. Okay, that's a bumblebee. That still doesn't tell you as much as eight individuals of Bombus vosnesenskii. So you're taking this kind of broad observation and narrowing it down, and then you can say exactly how many species visited at what time, what, what plant species, what time of year, what was the exact uh, GPS location, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's why those labels, those scientific labels that you can see underneath the, spe the species are so important. Um, that is what makes it a piece of scientific data. And as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, it's a big project keeping everything straight. <laughs> um, so far we've caught about uh, 1,700 specimens um, and the season is not over. So we've still got a ways to go. Um, but it's just really important for us that we uh, make sure that everything is recorded scientifically and then we can keep track of stuff and it ultimately it becomes um, a record in the annals of scientific history for this area. Um, even 100 years later, you know, if, if I preserve my specimens well, even 100 years later, someone can come back and say, wow, this, this butterfly species was here at, in, in 2020 at this time of year. Um, and without the specimen, that wouldn't be possible. So it's, uh, it's really like a, a piece of, a piece of natural history. Pretty cool. Um, so we have, uh, for this, for this project, we have three sites. Um, today I'm just going to talk about tree of life, which is that little dot up North, uh, right here. Um, just South of, uh, Ronald W. Casper's wilderness park. I'm sure you all know and love it. Um, Oh, it's, it's a shame. I, I wish we were on site today. I know it's not possible, but uh, it's, it's really special to uh, be able to have this collaboration with Tree of Life Nursery and, and be able to continue collecting data for so many years. Um, the more data that's collected on a site year after year, the more valuable it becomes because you can make statements about changes over time and kind of track, track the changes in that way. Um, uh, so here are a few of the, the species that we're using. You can see there's a mix of both native and non-native. Um, we'll just briefly, briefly go over this. Um, we've got some Bahiopsis, uh, and, uh, uh, Escalonia, which is a common one, um, in landscaping. Um, of course, California buckwheat, uh, bottle brush, uh, Spanish lavender, uh, catmint, nipita. Um, we've got them all. If you, if you are, if you're truly curious about all of the plant lists that we've studied, uh, talk to me afterwards and we can get into the, get into the, the nitty gritty of why we chose all these different species and, and kind of what all of their different importance is. Um, so we tackled the question, um, do native plants get higher visitation than non-native plants? Um, do they get more diverse visitation than non-native plants? And are they visited by more native bees and native pollinators or fewer honeybees than non-native plants? Um, 
essentially we were asking these questions uh, because um, the, the hypothesis is that native plants will be visited by both more and more diverse visitors than non-native plants because of course they've co-evolved in tandem with these native visitors. Um, but we really didn't know. And you know, you, you, you can't really make a statement like that without kind of sitting down, uh, staring at those, staring at those plants yourself and collecting the data. Um, so uh, we found that uh, native plants are on the left, uh, non-native plants are on the right. Um, as you can see, native plants received significantly more visitors per minute than did non-native plants. Um, but the individual plant species differed significantly as well. You can see that uh, fourth from the left, S. apiana there had almost 100% honeybees. Um, whereas in Celia, which is uh, California brittle bush in Celia Californica, um, received a much higher percentage of native visitors. Um, of course, honeybees are the yellow and uh, other different types of pollinators are all the other different colors. Um, but you can also see that the highest uh, visitation on a non-native species was actually much higher than a lot of the native species. So it's, 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 it's not as easy as saying, yeah, native plants rule, non-native plants are, are horrible. It's, you really have to take it on a case by case basis and look at the data for each of them in order to make these decisions about what types of pollinators you want to attract to your garden and uh, what resources you can provide for them. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions on this as well. I just wanna, I know we're getting a little pressed for time. So I wanna, I wanna keep on moving on. Um, and we also have here, uh, this is one of the more exciting parts of our project. Not only did we get um, information about what types of insects we're visiting, we also got information on um, their, their behavior on the flowers. So we had, we recorded the number of flowers that each visitor visited as, as they were foraging. And we also got the seconds that they spent on the plant overall. Um, so you can see on, on the y-axis on the left-hand side here that it says um, mean seconds per flower, which is basically the average number of seconds that, let's say that, let's say that one honeybee visits, um, it lands, it forages, it flies away. Um, we take, you know, a hundred honeybee visits and we push them all together and we get the average number of uh, seconds that each honeybee spent on a flower overall. Um, and you can see that all these different groups here um, actually had, they, they, not only did they differ hugely from each other, for example, honeybees and bumblebees had way different types of visitation. Beetles were way different from wasps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also uh, the rainbow color uh, shows all of the different plant species you can see along the bottom here. Um, so not only was each uh, visitor different uh, from other visitors, uh, each visitor also behaved differently on different plants. Um, so you can see that this is a very uh, complex textured uh, plant pollinator landscape, um, which is really not easily summed up in kind of one or two words about what's sort of quote unquote best for pollinators. Um, we really have to look at the data on a case by case basis and, and determine it in that way. Um, and yeah. So um, that was all of our, that's, that's been our research so far. We're still looking at uh, all of the work that we've been doing through 2020. That's gonna be incorporated as well in the future. Um, I think if we have a couple more minutes to just go over some of the cool uh, native bee species that, that you can probably find in your backyard or that you can find in sort of a local public park, um, that's gonna be really fun. So let's take a look at that. And Yes, uh, so Agapostamon texanus is, uh, remember that gorgeous shiny green bee kind of race car green that we saw earlier um, in the photos? Um, basically, uh, even though they have this sort of really flashy exotic look, um, they're extremely common. Um, they're probably in your backyard. Uh, the best, probably the best place to find them on is on an aster or a sort of a sunflower type of plant, um, just in my sort of personal anecdotal observation. I often see them collecting pollen on the, the flat uh, surface of those flowers. Um, and you can see that uh, the one on the left and the one on the right look quite different. Um, that's actually what's known as sexual dimorphism, which is where the male and female of a species uh, look significantly different. Uh, like elephant seals, where the male, you know, is five times bigger than the female. In this case, uh, with Agapostamon texanus, um, the male actually has uh, this awesome black and yellow abdomen, uh, presumably to scare predators away to think that he is a sting when he doesn't. Um, and then the female is just kind of that gorgeous, uh, gorgeous green all over. Um, Xylocopa veripuncta, um, also known as the valley carpenter bee. Um, oh, could you get that please? Thank you. Um, 
Uh, that is another bee with sexual dimorphism. Again, the males on the left and the females on the right. Um, you can see that the male is so cute and fluffy and golden. Uh, they're sometimes called teddy bear bees for that reason. Um, that is the largest bee in California. And you can often find them as well. Um, some people think of carpenter bees as pests because they chew holes in wood. Um, I think that uh, if you have a log or something in your yard where, where you can see a little hole chewed in and then a bunch of little yellow poops on, on the pavement in front of it, um, just let it be. Uh, hang out by it, you might be able to see some carpenter bees flying in and out. Um, they have these cute little burrows. Um, so that's the largest bee in California. And actually, um, one of the smallest bees in the world uh, can be found uh, just uh, just uh, within within a stone's throw of Tree of Life Nursery itself. Um, that's more kind of up in the desert in, in Riverside County. Um, but Perdita minima is the world's smallest bee, um, as, as, as we can remember from our previous chat about uh, teeny tiny bees visiting teeny tiny flowers and big bees visiting big flowers. Um, you can see on the left that Perdita minima is visiting these uh, eensy beensy flowers of white margin sand mat um, and other tiny kind of ground cover spurges. Um, and you can see it almost looks like a wasp or an ant, you know, it's, it's so, it's so small and it doesn't really have that, what we sort of think of as that, that bee fuzziness and fluffiness, but it is definitely still a bee as well. Um, and, uh, one of the cooler ones that, that I found, uh, Zacosmia maculata, uh, you can see it looks pretty, it also looks pretty unusual. It doesn't really look like a bee either. Um, the reason for that is because it is what's known as a kleptoparasite. So much like kleptomania, uh, klepto means thief, um, so it's a thieving parasite. Um, what it actually does is it, uh, it looks for the nests of anthophora bees, which are these digger bees, um, and it basically burrows its way into the nest, um, finds the pollen ball that the female has made. Um, the pollen ball will have a little egg laid on top of it, which is how that anthophora is going to reproduce. But uh, not if the not if the nest parasite has anything to say about. So it'll kick off the egg. It might eat it, or it might just kind of you know kick it aside, um, and it'll lay its own egg there. Um, so it actually steals the resources that that female has collected, um, much like a cuckoo, a cuckoo bird, uh, you know, kicking the other eggs out of the nest. Um, this is a cuckoo bee. <laughs> so um, it was actually caught uh, here at Tree of Life on Bahiopsis sicciniata. Um, and believe it or not, um, it's actually the first record of that bee species in the county, um, which is pretty cool, I think. And uh, it just goes to show that, you know, even um, even with, you know, even with kind of science being as, as advanced as it is, there's still so much that we don't know about the natural world. Um, and uh, there's so much that uh, is still out there waiting to be discovered. Um, and I just, I just think it looks so cool. And it just has these, it just has this really uh, kind of aggressive wasp like look. Um, but the reason that it doesn't need to be fluffy is because it's not doing any pollen collection of its own. Um, it's just waiting, waiting to bum off of somebody else's hard work collecting pollen. Um, oh yes. So uh, essentially these are just a few more of the, uh, of, of the gorgeous uh, pollinators that live in our area. That lower right-hand one was also a photo taken at Tree of Life. Um, yeah, the, the vast majority of these um, are, are native, you know, very little is known about them, about their biology, about what plants they like to visit, about the, the complex relationships that they have. Um, as you can see from, from the data that we collected, even over the course of two years at this one little site, um, these relationships are extremely complex and uh, last over years. Um, you know, the, 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 the interrelationship between uh, plants and pollinators uh, is one that is still being studied and there's still a lot to discover. Um, so it's just really important to conserve uh, native pollinators wherever we can and uh, try to give them a helping hand and um, yeah, and I, I just I, I just love I love bugs and I love native pollinators and I hope that everyone else does too. Um, so thanks to everyone for their contributions, especially to Tree of Life um, for the assistance with the plot and uh, for donating the native plants and to Altman for donating the non-native plants. And uh, thanks everyone so much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. All right, thank you, Annika. I appreciate that. Um, and, and this just goes to show um, you know, how much of science really goes into answering these types of questions and to understand the world around us, uh, and especially with our uh, landscape choices as well. Um, 
And, and, and that's what uh, I'm glad that you as the scientists are asking these important questions and actually putting boots on the ground <laughs> to, to, to see what, what pollinators and what, what's the interaction that's actually occurring um, and seeing how what we plant matters in, in, our, in our landscapes, not just in our own yards, but uh, also throughout uh, you know, open spaces and, and in our urban settings as well to provide these kind of, like you were saying, the corridors for even uh, some of our, our pollinators as well. Um, so thank you for that. And it's been, it's been a pleasure seeing you out there catching these pollinators and, and, and really looking in <clears throat> so, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks so much for uh, providing the, providing the, the, the foundation. Okay, <laughs> I appreciate that. Can you uh, uh, un or stop sharing your screen there? Yes, definitely. We'll go, okay. So right. uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you wish we could have been out there on the plots themselves to see this really interesting garden, a unique mix of natives and non-natives in this grid-like fashion and what's going on there. And so uh, we are actually going to go and look at those. Uh, previously, last year, we were able to uh, get up from the, the, the presentation and, and walk over to the research plots themselves. But uh, with the way things are now, we actually pre-recorded uh, Mike Evans, one of the, the owner of Tree of Life Nursery, uh, with Annika to go and actually talk about these plants. And I have even caught a few and saw some research that I think we even caught one that you hadn't seen there before, which is exciting. Yeah, definitely. And so we are going to play that video here now for you guys. If you have questions, uh, stick around and ask them in the uh, comment section. And we'll select a few and, uh, and do a little Q&A at the end. Annika, if you're able to stick around for that, we would love yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so without further ado, um, this is our first time doing this through Zoom to YouTube with all this technology, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So uh, hold on one second, let me get that going. Uh, Annika, again, if you could mute your, thank you. Okay. Good morning. Here we are at Tree of Life Nursery out in the back 40 in the middle of a planting which is one of the most interesting and somewhat perplexing that we have with a few exotic plants and many native plants randomly planted in a big rectangle here in this field. Fortunately we have with us Annika Neighbors who is active with University of California Cooperative Extension in San Diego County. She's working on this project with project manager, Dr. Leah Korkiti, who for many years worked at Tree of Life Nursery. Joining us is Dakota the nursery dog, <laughs> who has found a shady spot here on this hot day. And by chance, Seraphine Tovar is watering today. But know this, these plants have been in about three years now and they get water even now in this 95 almost 100 degree weather that we're experiencing only once a month or once every five weeks a deep soak by hand that's another topic but it's coincidental that Seraphine is here watering while we're here today to talk about this garden so Annika hello welcome again we've seen you many times here collecting the data that you're presenting as this part of this presentation but uh what are the nuts and bolts of this planning what's what's really happening here yeah ab absolutely um so it's definitely not the most oh like this okay um it's definitely oh like this okay um it's definitely not the most aesthetic of gardens, um, but it is really important to allow us to collect the data that we need to do to, to figure out this experiment. So essentially we have both native and non-native perennial species here. Uh, you'll see just by a quick glance over that, that we'll do in a bit, uh, we've got some really common natives and some common non-native ornamentals as well. And essentially what we're doing is, uh, I mean, to put it in a nutshell, we're seeing which plants the bugs like best. <laughs> so. Uh, this is a plot that has a purpose, and I think some of the involvement involves United States Department of Agriculture and, of course, University of California. Are there other plots like this elsewhere, or is this the only one? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, UCCE San Diego has two other plots uh, in San Diego County, and we're comparing the data of those with the different species that we have. Um, but there are over a dozen uh, organizations um, all over the United States doing the same thing, um, and it's administered by Rutgers, um, which is that uh, USDA, let's see, what is it, uh, Specialty Crops Research Initiative, um, and that's that's what all this work is funded by. Yeah. Okay, so we feel really privileged here at Tree of Life to be part of your world of research and so we really want to thank you for being here today to talk this through for our, our viewers but also for the months of time you've spent out here I've seen you sitting on a little platform <laughs> a little stool and staring at a plant um, for minutes or even hours at a time it's the oddest thing but what are you really doing? I know you're not asleep because you're quite alert while you're doing it and you seem to have a counter in your hand. Um, yeah, so basically the only way to answer these big complicated questions about uh, pollination ecology and the health of pollinators and ornamental gardens is to really just sit down and, and stare at plants and, and kind of do the work. So what I do is I have developed a protocol uh, along with a lot of my colleagues uh, whereby we can actually take a look at these plants and uh, measure what what types, both what types of bees and other pollinators are coming uh, and how many are coming and what kind of species diversity we have. So as I'm sure you can imagine, um, keeping track of these little bees and, and, and flies that are buzzing here and there uh, takes quite a bit of concentration. So we observe each plant for five minutes at a time. Uh, we try to mark down every single insect that comes to the plant during that time. And if, if we're lucky, we can also measure uh, how many flowers they visit during that visit and how long each one takes so that we can quantify, so that we can quantify um, for example, say that a honeybee, when it's visiting a plant, it visits 20 flowers at a time, but maybe a butterfly only visits three flowers. Uh, that, that's a big difference in the amount of pollination that it can perform. Wow, that is an incredible amount of data. Is that the same protocol that's being carried out at the other sites? Um, so we try to standardize the protocol as much as possible so that data can be compared uh, throughout the study. Um, different places need different protocols, of course. Um, in a lot of other places, uh, for example, in the Northeast, they actually, we started our data collection in April or sometimes even as early as March because here in the beautiful Southern California weather, uh, stuff starts blooming a lot more quickly. Um, however, in the Northeast, they often don't get started until even May or June. So we have to have some regional variation, but we try to do our best to make it comparable. So like where in the Northeast? What states? Um, we've got New Jersey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, we've got New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, I think there's one in Ohio. I know that they have one, uh, this isn't the Northeast, but they have one up in Northern California at UC Davis um, and just sites, sites all, all over the United States. Wow, this is really fascinating. So I remember the day we planted this and there was this random um, approach to the design without any uh, bias or uh, input by anybody. I think we th somebody threw something over their shoulder and that's, <laughs> or no, not really. It was done on a computer program that randomized. The spacing is uniform, but the species, and I'm looking at lavender, which is native to the Mediterranean region, white sage, a California native, more California natives like buckwheat, San Diego sunflower, Ceanothus toyon, lemonade berry, white sage, a couple more Ceanothus, and then I see the exotics include Escalonia, rosemary, uh, is there an acacia, bottle brush. So when people have walked by here knowing that Tree of Life is all about native plants and they see a few uh, non-native plants, in fact some of the most common and conspicuous non-native exotic plants that are in ornamental landscapes, they question, what are you doing out here? <laughs> so uh, the reason why the two that is native and exotic plants are planted in the same plot is also part of your study is to compare which plants are the most effective at attracting uh, pollinators. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. So essentially we want to keep the data with as little bias as possible. So imagine if we had all the natives squished over on one side of the plot and all the non-natives on the other. One of them might be 
you know, what one particular native species might be most attractive and increase visitation to that side. So we try to randomize it as much as possible and, uh, and observe it uh, with the randomization throughout the day as well. So that, you know, we're not just seeing one species, one plant species in the morning, one plant species in the afternoon. Um, because of course, uh, pollinators and bees and their visitation uh, varies a lot, both throughout the day and throughout the season. Oh, so we try to make sure that that is, has as little bias as possible. Okay, so Annika, this is fascinating, and I love the word randomize when it's used in science, and I want to just encourage everybody, if you're having a random day and things hap seem to be happening to you at random, and you may be even intentionally randomizing your activities today, you're practicing good science. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, the data, we haven't asked for the punchline. You're going to have to get that out of the presentation, but you can already guess which of the two groups, native or exotic plants, attract the most pollinators, especially when we talk about native species pollinators. But we'll leave that, even birds, do you count the birds? Um, so in, in, in our protocol, uh, at least for the current paper that we're publishing, we haven't been counting birds. Uh, we don't get too much visitation of birds other than hummingbirds, right. um, but we definitely see a lot of uh, passerines and, and warblers and other kinds of stuff like that. Uh, Feed, oh, they're nice. Yeah. They, they, like, they like to feed on the seed heads, um, and we definitely see a lot of them in the plot, so that, that's pretty cool. Right. Um, but we do have, definitely do see a lot of hummingbird visitation as well. And there's a, a little male, a couple male Kosas hummingbirds that come through and sometimes uh, scare the bejesus out of me when they're dive bombing, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to observe. Right, right. Okay, well, this is, this is the plot. We'd like to invite you to come and see it. Please uh, ask somebody at Casa La Paz or in our office uh, to accompany you up here because it's not close to anything else in the nursery. And it's all organic. We do weed control simply by hand using a hoe. We water by hand, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising how many pollinators find their way into this plot. So I'm going to leave my portion of this little presentation with this age-old saying, you plant it and they will come. <laughs> and that's our message about pollinators and native plants. In your garden or in any place that you plant native plants, there's the tiniest little bee right there. A little gold, oh, a little yeah. red one. Look at her go! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if we got it. Sometimes we can nail this, but sometimes not so much. All right, so I don't know if we can if we can see that here. I'm sorry, I need to put under the shade of my hood. That's okay, fine. so what this actually looks like is uh, is not a bee. It actually looks like a tiny little hemipteran. So um, hemipterans are probably best known for their role. Oh, but see, there's a little tiny microhymenopteran right there. Oh, see? nice. Oh, there it goes. Is that a pollinator also? Um, so it it's so <laughs> the concept of pollinator is a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, any type of thing, whether it's an insect or even like a bird or even a lizard in, in, has been known to in, be in some cases, mm -hmm. it's technically a quote unquote pollinator. Mm -hmm. um, but not all pollinators are created the same. Some right. are a lot more effective. If, if you get in and roust a, a, a flower, like a bat does at night on some organ pipe cactus or something, you're a pollinator. Oh, absolutely. You yeah. Know. Bats are bats are crucial, crucial pollinators for a lot of uh, yucca, cactus, right. um, agave, stuff yeah. like that. So the little red guy that I call the bee is not a bee. Yes, it is actually a hemipteran. Uh, those are best known as actually being uh, really bad plant pests. Mm -hmm. uh, aphids and scale bugs are both hemipterans. Um, but in this case, this looks like a myridae, which is a plant bug. Um, if you kind of bash the, the branches or the leaves of any perennial that you have growing in your yard, uh, you're probably likely to see a big flood of, of myridae uh, plant bugs pouring out. Um, in this case, uh, they, they, are, they do have those piercing sucking mouth parts that mm. allow them to feed on the plant juices, but a lot of them will often act as pollinators as well, simply because of the fact that they walk across the flower, they feed on that sweet, sweet concentrated nectar, which is just like a plant juice, but more concentrated, mm -hmm. right? And then and then they go to the next flower and that makes them act as a pollinator, even though that isn't their, the purpose, the quote unquote purpose that they were evolved for, uh, but they can still perform that function. Wow. Yeah. And they also, I would imagine are part of the little stippled leaves and some of the damage that I often see on San Diego sunflower. Definitely. So we have a, a, a double oh, agent yeah. working amongst us. <laughs> yeah. So it, um, <laughs> 
it's it's really it's generally in uh, in most cases it's really hard to say that a certain type of insect is all good or all bad. Um, mm -hmm. Often, even these sort of very sort of uh, hated pests by gardeners and, and nursery owners. Um, they often perform uh, important ecosystem functions as well. Wow, is that ever good to hear? <laughs> because so many times, even vegetable gar people with their vegetable gardens or ornamental plants and certainly native plant gardens are worried about plant pests, injurious plant pests, which, of course, if they go out of hand, can cause serious damage. But the control measures have to be really carefully chosen, isn't that right, in order to protect all insects, including beneficials, when you're targeting to protect a plant by eliminating the presence of a really bad insect. Absolutely. So uh, a major part of the research that UC Cooperative Extension does is on integrated pest management or IPM. Um, this is basically the concept that you use the minimum amount of, of force or the minimum amount of control necessary to achieve your goals uh, without damaging the rest of the plant or the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, of course, uh, pest management is not just pesticides. Uh, there's a, many different measures that, that people can use. Um, and generally the goal is to have the ecosystem be as intact as possible while still being able to have a sustainable human use. I love that that was stated so elegantly. And I have to comment, I don't know how much of the detail inside that net really showed up on camera, but that little expert swish and flick of the wrist <laughs> was no small deal. There's well, a lot of practice there. Oh yeah, so just <laughs> just just a few years. Um, but let's let's try to catch a honeybee and see if we can we can talk a little bit about. Okay, that. and also in that there were three or four or five different species in the net, and oh, one yeah. poking around outside the net just now. That's right. Yeah. And so, so that's five species that on one swish of the net. How many species of of uh, insects at this time of day on a day like today, just a rough estimate. What's the range of this number of species that would be flying around on these flowers? Oh my goodness. Well, um, <laughs> I can <laughs> say, <laughs> that's, that's, I, I can say that science literally does not know how many species, uh, could be flying around here at any given time. Mm -hmm. Um, not only because uh, not only because things vary so much from day to day, from season to season, and from year to year, uh, but also because I'm sure many of these species are just plain unknown to science. Wow. Um, but I can say that over the course of uh, three years of sampling just pollinators, just flower visitors here at Tree of Life, um, we've gotten uh, over 85 different species of bees, flies, butterflies, wasps, beetles, Oh goodness, uh, dragonflies, damselflies, uh, what else have we got? Oh, um, true bugs, of course, mir uh, hemipterans, and I hon honestly, the list goes on. Wow. Yeah, let's, wow. let's try and catch a honeybee and see okay. if we can have one of those examples. Okay, okay. The, right. the, 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 the common honeybee, there's a little, oh, yeah. that's a cool moth. Oh, oh sorry, it was in my hand wet and got in the way. That's okay. Um, let's see if we got, yeah, that's actually the cool moth. And oh, here's, here's a great example of, of that diversity I was talking about. I've literally never, Where'd you go, you little buddy? I've literally never seen this species of moth before here at Tree of Life. Um, but okay, I, it's a first on camera, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But I've, I've, I literally see new species here every day. Um, and actually, one of the really cool species that I found, I don't know if we can, can we see it in the net at all? Mm -hmm. Can I, like that, is that, is that a little There's bit better? There's underside. Yeah, the underside. Um, oh, oh, there we pretty go. Pretty wings. Yeah, that sort of gorgeous gold and, and white and, and gray. Um, we actually have had um, a bee species county record here in Orange County. Um, the, the species that I found actually was also snagged off of Bahiopsis liciniata, um, another native aster. Um, and it was uh, the first time that that bee species had ever been recorded in Orange County. Um, and it was a, a cuckoo digger bee, um, Zacosme immaculata. Um, there are these things called cuckoo bees, which just like a cuckoo bird, um, they basically find uh, their host nest which is a little burrow under the ground with a big ball of pollen on it and the little baby bee egg sitting on top of it. Just like a cuckoo, they kick the, the baby egg out of the nest or they might just eat it. And then they lay their own eggs on that pollen ball, which the, the previous mom had worked so hard to, to collect. And so they, they basically sort of uh, parasitize the nest. Um, so that was one of the really, really cool species that, that I was lucky enough to catch uh, here in 2018. So you get to add this moth that you caught today while we're doing this little segment to your list. Yes, exactly. And this and this is a brand. This is a, an, another new species on the list. So they chalk chalk one one more up. Okay, you can't stage this kind of stuff. <laughs> no, you were in the process though of uh, 
showing us a honeybee. Are you going to pin this little guy? Uh, yes. So the the specimen collection process, um, unfortunately, they do have to die. Um, but it's it's for it's for the greater cause of science. And having having this one moth uh, be sort of the the sacrificial lamb uh, gives us the data and the information in order to save thousands of moths. So I th I think that's pretty cool. It also gives us a, an elegant display because if you know an entomologist, thank them for their incredible skill in pinning even the tiniest of insects in such an artful way with the name and the date and the place and the insect on display for identification. And you know insect collections perhaps from museums and from academia and yes, the insects are dead, but you know what? I've seen them and I consider them almost works of art. Mm, definitely. And what's really cool about uh, especially scientific entomological collections is that that label that you mentioned with the name, date, place, time, uh, sometimes GPS coordinates, um, without that label, that specimen is just a dead bug. But right. with that label, it's an it's an irreplaceable, unerasable uh, data point that proves that this species of insect was here at this time. Um, I used to work at the San Diego Natural History Museum and the Natural History Museum had specimens that were literally collected by Charles Darwin in the Galapagos. Wow. Having that sort of unbroken thread of, of, of scientific evidence um, allows us to answer so many more questions about the natural world. But we don't recommend that you pin the common housefly when you swat it on your window screen. <laughs> no, no, they, they, ha they have to still be nice quality and still whole. There you go. <laughs> no swatted insects right, should well, be let's pinned. Just, let's try and get us a, a, a honeybee. Let's see. Uh, this Bahiopsis is too, it's too rich with native insects. All I'm seeing is native insects. There's one over here. Oh, wait, here's a honeybee. Um, can, you, you, can you see? Yeah. Okay. All right, so it's kind of a tennis swing sort of situation. Swing and swoop. Generally goes pretty fast. All right, let's see if we can hear this little lady. Can we hear her? Oh, yeah. Nice. All right. So this, um, oh, thank you so much. So this is a honeybee, um, Apis mellifera. Uh, mellifera means honey bearer or honey carrier. Um, and what's really interesting about honeybees, a lot of people don't know, um, you know, people say, save the bees, you know, the bees are in trouble. And when they're, when they say that they're talking about honeybees, but in fact, uh, honeybees have been here in California for less than 200 years. Um, they were originally introduced uh, by European settlers, uh, for, of course, for their honey, you know, hives, hives of, of bees were, were carried around so that they could produce honey. Um, but now of course they're an integral part of the modern agricultural system. Um, but in, I know we're here in Orange County, I don't know how many species there are in Orange County, but in San Diego County, there are over 700 species of native bees, wow. which are not honeybees. Um, most of them don't live in hives, most of them don't produce honey, and most of them are actually solitary instead of living in a colony like honeybees do with workers and queens. They're kind of just more like, um, I don't know, just like, they just do their own thing, like a bird or a... a little family unit. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they just kind of, they just kind of live their lives out solo, just like any other sort of wild animal. Um, so this honeybee um, is a huge part of the of the landscape of Southern California. Um, even in wild areas, they're very dominant uh, because uh, these these uh, domesticated colonies, uh, of course, they reproduce by swarming, and the swarms are not really you can't really like tell them where to go. Like you can't sort of say, hey, stay in stay in your box. Uh, so they kind of uh, <laughs> spread out into the landscape, um, and they're what they're what's called feral honeybees. Um, so the, the vast majority of the honeybees that you kind of see out and about, unless you're literally right next to a hive box are probably going to be feral. Um, so these, these are an introduced species that scientists are still trying to understand what impact they might have on, uh, both native, native, uh, bees and other insects and native pollination regimes. Um, but it's definitely a, a fascinating question. That is a great thing. Now, some people who are quite, not quite as familiar with the how easy it is to, to be a, a gardener with native plants. Uh, question whether there, there's a sting potential or, mm. or whether, whether bees in the landscape because of the flowering plants pose some sort of threat. Um, aside from severe allergies, what uh, have you do you get stung a lot? 
Um, so when I, I used to actually work with and research Africanized bees, um, and I only had one bad stinging incident, which is a, a whole other story. Definitely steer clear of Africanized bees and beehives if you're not sure. Um, but I have been, over the course of my three years of working on this project, I've been stung once, and it's because I netted it and I was actually trying to pinch it with my fingers and put it in the right place in the net to catch it. Yeah. And it stung me through the net. Um, my finger swelled up a tiny bit of itch for like a day or two, but it was okay. Um, the funny thing about most bees is that uh, they, they really only sting when they feel that they or their colony is being threatened. So honeybees, uh, of course, they'll defend their hive very aggressively. But when they're out and about uh, landing on the flowers, um, unless you really like sit on them or try to crush them in some way, they don't, they're not personally invested in the situation. They just want to get out of there. <laughs> okay. So if you, if you poke them and bother them, they'll probably just fly away. Right. And the, and most native bees, um, as I said, they don't live in hives um, and they don't really have any honey to guard. So they're even less likely to sting you. So if you, even, even if you, even if you bump against one, you know, uh, like, like if, if, if your, if your butt bumps against a bush or whatever, the bee's probably just going to fly away. It really has no interest in stinging you, especially since when honeybees sting, they die. They'd rather not die if at all possible. So they, 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 they would prefer not to sting you. That, that's a really clear answer. And, and I know from years of gardening with native plants, I'm in them all year, every day, different times of year. And I do pruning or I walk through and they could be absolutely loaded and just, just honeybees everywhere. And you can be working right in that plant and they'll just buzz around you and oh, yeah. make sure to stay out of your way. And they, they make no intent whatsoever to sort of attack you. But um, can you give us a quick update on the status of the Africanized honeybee in Southern California today? Because I think people might have that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so essentially, Africanized honeybees are often seen as kind of a boogeyman or sort of this, you know, oh, the killer bees. Um, that's a big misconception. Um, they're basically visually indistinguishable from sort of quote unquote domesticated or European honeybees. Um, the only difference is uh, they have a slight genetic difference and uh, some slight things where you'd have to measure the leg and multiply that by 2.3 and then measure the wing and multiply that by 0.8. Um, essentially, they just have a more aggressive uh, defensive behavior when it comes to their colonies. Um, an Africanized bee on the plant is essentially indistinguishable other than genetically from uh, a standard domesticated honeybee. Um, they really don't want to mess with you unless you start messing with them in their hives. Um, and from a recent study that was done uh, barcoding a lot of the, the sort of fairly caught honeybees in Southern California. Um, it was found that up to 80% of bees sort of caught off of flowers are Africanized. So if you see a hive kind of uh, when you're hiking, maybe you hear uh, um, um, a suspicious buzzing in, in the tree overhead, you're just gonna wanna assume that it is Africanized and just steer clear of it as much as possible. Um, but essentially, uh, other, like you said, other than severe allergies, or if you're really just getting your face up in a beehive, uh, the average person really has nothing to be concerned about. Okay, that's good to know because we want to dispel these fears about the killer bee. At the same time, it's, it's interesting that the, they are that common, but, but unless you're in there really harming their, their colony mm -hmm. or their hive, they're gonna leave you alone. What about swarms? I saw on a hot day just recently out in the, well, out in Pine Valley, mm. uh, an, an awesome swarm, mm -hmm. you know, and it came right near me and it was swarming on a branch right over my car, big oak tree. And I just asked it to keep moving, move right <laughs> along. I said, it's early enough in the day. You don't need to stop here. Keep moving, keep moving. Swarms are essentially harmless, right? Because they have one goal and it's not stinging you. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So um, honeybees uh, reproduce by swarming. It's kind of this uh, colonial idea of reproduction. Of course, the queen... Oh, got a fly in the ear there. Um, of course, uh, the queen is the one who lays the eggs and is sort of the, the main reproductive agent. But the way that the colonies themselves reproduce is the colony will kind of split in half and one half will go and swarm and try to find a new hive location and the other, the other sort of older half will stay where it is. Um, and they're really just looking for a home. Uh, so oftentimes you'll see them uh, my dad had one uh, on his fence and in his uh, in his his trash bins, and that was there for about a week or so. Generally, if they're there for longer than about a week or two, um, you're going to want to call a no-kill apiarist or beekeeper, and they can come and get that taken away for you. Um, but generally, they'll just be there for a couple days. What they're doing is they're actually sending out scouts. Um, 
or individual workers, the individual workers will kind of investigate uh, where they think might be a good potential hive location. They come back uh, and then they sort of give their message with the waggle dance, similar to how they give the message about where, where floral resources are. Um, and then uh, the hive uh, sort of decides um, similar to, to the way that neurons decide in a brain what thought is going to happen, the hive sort of decides uh, where the new, the new uh, hive location is going to be. So there, actually, I would say that bees while they're swarming, or honeybees while they're swarming, actually pose the least danger to you because they have no honey to protect, no, no larvae to protect, um, and they're, they're just trying to find a new home. Right. Maybe you've seen on, on uh, Believe It or Else, where some old boy can catch the queen in flight, put her on his chin, and end up with a big jello <laughs> beard of, of a swarm of bees. We love that kind of stuff. Well, thanks for the um, diversion on the questions about the Italian honeybee and or European honeybee and its status in California with the Africanization. And the take home is we want to attract pollinators to our gardens. Honeybees are going to be there, but you know what the real take home is the, the 700 species native to San Diego County and we're just a stone's throw from the county line where we are right now. So I'm going to go with that number of native bee and then the myriad of other native pollinating insects add in hummingbirds and a few orioles and a few other birds and then some other casual pollinators and you've got a super important role to play by planting native plants in natural gardens and grouping them in a natural way to replicate habitat and, and bring back the bees, but we're not talking about honeybees. There was just a hummingbird right there. There was, okay. Yeah, well, yeah things happen on cue around here sometimes. <laughs> bring back the bees, but don't be concentrating on that statement relating to honeybees. They're fine. They're, they're in no danger whatsoever, but the native species need native plants. And they find them in native areas, but they want to find them in your garden as well. Annika, thank you so much for explaining this to us. I'm looking at these plants with new eyes now, and I want to get me one of those nets <laughs> and practice that swish flick because that is awesome. Hey, so, 20 bucks on bioquip.com. Bioquip.com. <laughs> I'm not sponsored or paid no. by them. They, 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 just do, they just make great products. They do, and they make the styrofoam boards. Here, oh, yeah, they do. Here's something I learned, that in the very, very old days, the insides of the agave stock which is spongy and, and a lot like styrofoam, dried, was actually used for pinning insects. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know by whom, but by science itself. All right, <laughs> what am I going to say now? I'm going to say thank you again. Thank you, Kevin Allison, behind the camera over there. Would you give us a wave? There he is. <laughs> He's the producer and the uh, technician and the cameraman and the uh, sponsor and the um, director of this here affair, and we have just been privileged to see one more fine example of the best of California. Was there something over there? Okay, thank you guys all for watching that. Uh, Annika, are you still there? This is live, so here we are. <laughs> yes, hello, here I am. Sorry, okay. getting on uh, getting on camera again. Uh, actually, okay. sorry, give me, give me one second. <laughs> okay, so we are going to do uh, a bit of a Q&A section. Um, I can tackle one of these, uh, and then I, I think that'd be a good way to start. Um, but yeah, so thank you guys all for watching that. We are coming to the close of this workshop. We will answer some of your questions that came in through the um, Q&A or through the comments section here. So I will try to get to a few of them. Um, hopefully we can answer as many of these as possible. But um, one question that kind of came together with a few people had a very similar question, uh, El Hamak and um, a couple other people had something similar, uh, Mary Jarvis as well. All were asking basically about resources. So uh, Annika, maybe you can add in on this, but uh, what type of uh, resources are available for people that want to either identify native bees themselves uh, or 
plants that will attract those pollinators as well. I know from us, we at Tree of Life have a lot of re uh, resources on our website. They're available in uh, PDF downloads, or we also have them here available as handouts at the nursery. Uh, but these are a lot of uh, things that to track the uh, specific bees um, and also pollinator uh, butterflies and other uh, moths and other things like that as well. Uh, the host plants that you can uh, find those. Um, if anybody knows Calscape through the California Native Plant Society, uh, mm. they have an incredible list of all native plants, even in your region. You can type in where you are. Uh, and it will give you a list of plants there. Um, it has all the horticultural information, but a really excellent new feature that they have just added also includes uh, confirmed or possible um, uh, uh, host plants that that plant would be for, for uh, specific pollinators. Um, so that's an excellent resource to take uh, into consideration. Uh, Bob, Al our good friends Bob Allen and Fred Roberts wrote uh, a wildflower of Orange County and the Santa Ana Mountains, which is, even though it's pretty specific to Orange County, is a really good research for all of uh, Southern California in general. Uh, Bob, as we know, is a good and incredible entomologist, and so he includes a lot of that plant pollinator interaction within uh, the, the, the book on the native plants themselves. So there's that. And, and as you see that there's, there's a lot of unknown when it comes to, uh, as, uh, to the science of what bees are out there and what native pollinators, as Annika stated earlier, that there's a lot to be researched in this, in this field. So we encourage you all to be citizen scientists and uh, plant these plants uh, in your yard and, and, and engage in that, in that natural garden and see what you find. And, you can report your findings to websites like iNaturalist and, and things like that. And that will help to answer these type of questions. And, and you yourself will become a native bee and plant pollinator interactive scientist in your region um, and especially your yard. So there's that. Um, Annika, do you have any other suggestions on where people can find resources for plant pollinator action, but also identification? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so iNaturalist is wonderful. Uh, they have a great community of people. Um, if you upload a nice high quality focused photo, um, especially if you try to say, like if you try to, if you aren't just like, this is a bug, but if you try to say, this is a, this is a moth, this is a bee, this is a wasp, whatever, um, you'll often get a really great, great uh, high quality ID within just a couple days. Um, and that's all like on a volunteer basis. Um, I can also give a thumbs up to Calscape. I love that site. Um, Oh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know of any great uh, native pollinator resource guides, but maybe we can send out an email afterwards and I'll pull together a couple links. Um, I've got a big, a big uh, library of bookmarks of uh, different pollinator resources. So um, off the top of my head, I can't recall the URLs, but maybe we can send out an email afterwards. That, that, that would be great. Or I'll, okay, I'll perfect. Also try to put some of those links in the comment section here as well. Okay, let me, I, I can, I can try to hunt those down or I, it might be easier to just send it out afterwards. Cause yeah, that'd, that'd be great. I'll, I'm going to add them into the comments here. So if anybody finds this at a later date, they can scroll through and, and find those as well. Uh, perfect. But yeah, we will also send out an email blast. That's a, that's a great idea. Perfect. Um, another question that kind of came up a couple of times was do native bees sting? Uh, short answer. Yes. Um, long answer. Um, their sting is actually a lot less painful than honeybees um, generally because um, as, as we discussed in the talk and as we've seen um, throughout the video, um, they don't have any hive or any honey to protect. Um, so they really only need to protect themselves. Um, so their sting tends to be less painful. Um, and of course, uh, only female bees sting, male bees do not sting um, because the sting is actually a modified ovipositor or egg laying uh, uh, organ. <laughs> um, so only female bees uh, will sting. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you for clearing that up. Yes. Uh, another question came in from Laura. Laura, uh, actually the first comment on here, since honeybees are non-native, uh, are they harmful to our native bee species? And if so, should their populations, I'm meaning the honeybee population, should their growth be discouraged? Mm -hmm. Um, that is definitely a controversial question that will get a lot of pollination ecologists, uh, uh, at each other's throats. Um, I think that the, um, 
the evidence is really mixed in terms of that. Um, a lot of people have done research on, you know, do honeybees affect native bees directly or indirectly by taking resources or do they, um, you know, do, do they, do they damage them in some other way? Um, and honestly, the results are really mixed. Some people have found that honeybees will kind of bully native bees off of flowers. Um, some have found that they don't really care either way. Um, I think that it's, I, I, I honestly don't even want to make a statement one way or another, just because as I'm sure you can imagine, it is just such a complex issue. And of course, you know, in a lot of places where, um, especially where native bees are, uh, high like on the decline and where their populations are really low um honeybees are performing that important ecosystem service of pollination oftentimes they're the only ones that are left um give me just one second no problem so yeah so that it really speaks to the nature of science itself so we have as you would know um and see that nature is very complex and to answer these types of questions it's usually uh, the answer of well it depends you know and Definitely. there's a lot of answers that need to be mm -hmm. looked at and um it depends on the perspective and what you're looking at and so definitely you, and just as a follow-up um on that um uh whether and for, for the second part of that question you know whether their population numbers should be controlled um Unfortunately, the cat's pretty much out of the bag on that one. Um, as I said, uh, the majority of honeybees in the landscape have been found to be feral. Um, and uh, they, they really are, you know, the, the Southern California landscape uh, being the Mediterranean climate is basically exactly what they evolved to uh, reproduce in. And it's, it's really optimal for them. Um, so it's hard, like it's, it's, it's hard to say like it, it's not, it's not really kind of a switch that you can just flick, you know, like honeybees are, are pretty much here to stay. Um, it would, it would, it's, it would be an impossible task to send, sort of remove them, <clears throat> excuse me. It would be an impossible task to remove them from the landscape. Um, and they do provide um, a lot of ecosystem services as well as economic services of agricultural pollination. So it's not so much like, it's not so much, what should we do about honeybees? It's honeybees are here to stay. What does that mean for, um, for Southern California. Absolutely. Uh, very well said. Um, uh, and here's another question uh, that we had uh, Bobby Cressy asking, are the, are the other research plots in San Diego County open to the public? I, I didn't know this one either. Oh yeah. Um, so I guess the tree of life one is open to the public um, as long as you know, you have uh, a tree of life nursery staff person with you. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, just go ahead and ask us and we'll be happy to take it. <laughs> Nice. Um, so the other two are on publicly available land, but just from for me personally, if if you want to go and check it out, just please like just stand back and don't don't like mess with the plants or anything like that. Um, because it took us a while to establish those and get them built up. Um, but one of them is at Palomar College. Actually, they're probably not even open to the public because of the whole pandemic situation. But mm -hmm. uh, Palomar College is close to the public, but we have one on the campus there. And then at San Diego Botanic Garden in Encinitas, uh, we have another, um, but that's fenced in as well. So if you could just, just kind of peek your head over, check it out, and then, and then you know, don't, don't, don't mess with our data. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so they, I guess they are, they are technically publicly accessible, um, but we don't do tours or anything. So um, yeah. if you want to go and check one out, um, the San Diego Botanic Garden, I think, is open. They have limited hours now, so you could ask them at the front um, if you want to check it out, and they'll tell you where it is so just you can kind of peek, peek in there a bit yeah okay great um and then uh, a lot of people are asking and i know this is developing uh but um when are you guys going to publish this paper is it going to be available for people to check out or the presentation or at least more more of the actual raw data from this oh yeah absolutely um so i can uh so we're we're actually working on a scientific manuscript of the of the paper right now, and it's it's in its final stages. We're just choosing what scientific journal to publish it in. Um, so keep an eye out for that shortly. Um, the data, um, due to the rules of scientific publication, um, you really shouldn't publish your data in other places uh, before you get it sort of officially in the in the scientific record. Um, but I will uh, be shortly making. Um, uh, a website on the UC Cooperative Extension San Diego website um, that has kind of um, common pollinators you might see in Southern California, um, good plants to plant uh, that are kind of native friendly. Um, so kind of kind of on a, on a more general level. Um, I know somebody was asking about 
uh, if there could be a copy of the charts. Um, since those uh, are unpublished figures, unfortunately we can't make that exact data available, but I can definitely do, um, I'm hoping pretty soon to have uh, that uh, updated website available um, with kind of stuff for people to check out and kind of more concrete information. Yeah. Excellent. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on that one, Kevin. Okay, perfect. Uh, another question kind of came in asking about, uh, you wanna start a pollinator garden where do you start? Um, and I think this research that Annika and those at UCCE are doing is really helping to inform that type of information. I know it is for us when we have, we put together our, uh, our lists and pollinator plants uh, here at the nursery. Uh, and one question came up about what about rock stars in the garden? Is there some oh. research that you saw that was just incredible? I know Bahiopsis was definitely one that it's, uh -huh. that's what we kind of hovered around it much. <laughs> Pardon yeah, me. so, um, gee, rock stars. I guess it's, um, I, I hate to say it depends for every question, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of the nature of, of nature, I guess. It, it mm -hmm. really depends. Um, it also depends on what kind of stuff you want to attract. Um, for example, Ceanothus um, is really, really popular amongst uh, little tiny things because it has little tiny flowers. Um, so there are tons of teeny weeny cool little bees and wasps and cool stuff on Ceanothus. Um, but if you want kind of more like bigger, more dramatic stuff. Um, I would recommend, um, and this is just, this is not like scientific, like this, this is not like, I, I am not a doctor, I am not a lawyer. Like this is just my sort of uh, anecdotal recommendation. Um, I've seen a lot of butterflies on uh, verbena, verbena lilacina. Um, and I, Bahiopsis is a great one for all different kinds of stuff. Um, it's Feralcia ambigua, which I think is the, the mallow, globe mallow. Um, that actually has um, one of those specialists that we were talking about before, um, Diadesia, uh, loves visiting Sphoralsia, and a lot of other stuff does too, so you'll get a lot of cool bees specifically on that one. Um, and uh, especially later in the year, uh, California buckwheat, Areogonum fasciculatum, um, is a really cool one to see, like, because generally that's going to be later in the year uh, when a lot of other stuff is done blooming. Um, so that'll often be one of the few plant resources uh, or the few floral resources for, for pollinators. So you'll see like crazy wasps, you'll see crazy bees. Um, yeah, so that's, 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 my, that's my qualified recommendations. Perfect. And, and as, as like you said, nature is a lot of times these answers are it depends. Uh, but, and there's a lot of information out there and, and ecology and, and the science in, in itself can seem overwhelming when it comes to just native plants and how to garden. And, and, and then you add that extra layer of, you know, gardening for nature on top of it. And so mm -hmm. how do you do that? Um, and so I, I encourage you all to not get overwhelmed with the amount of information that you have yet to acquire uh, and come here to the nursery or speak to your nursery nearby um, and the native nurseries like ourselves. And we are a resource for you. Um, we will help you with asking those right types of questions that you may not, um, would, would even think about to consider. So we can ask you, okay, where do you live? And, and here's some good plants that would work really well in your soil type or whatever it might be. And then also add that layer, this one's really great for like the swallowtail uh, butterfly or seeing other things like those like smaller bees or you know some of those blue, uh, blue butterflies and things like that as well. So um, yeah, the re your, your nursery is your friend. So they can definitely, definitely help you with that and get it started. Mm -hmm. and, and again, gardening in itself, and especially with nature, is a, a science and an art. It's and um, it, I say every garden is you know occurs over time. It's constantly changing. Um, so if you plant it, they will come, and it's going to be a great uh, experience for you to to see what works, and then and then you again can contribute to science itself. Definitely, uh, like I naturalist. And I would also say that um, any like anything is better than nothing, you know, even if you just have one little, even if you just have one little, you know, native annual in the corner, your little California poppies in the corner, um, you know, bumblebees love California poppy. Um, so that, so that's yeah. a start right there. So, you know, definitely like start small and move up. I'm not much of a gardener myself. Um, but I just this year I started gardening on my little patio. Um, and I've had a lot of really great success. And um, we've got some hummingbirds come and I've seen uh, little native bees, you know, even in my like, suburb with green lawns um just on my tiny little concrete patio so um yeah anything is better than than nothing definitely excellent 
All right, well, Annika, well, I think this has been a very successful workshop um, and thank you all for uh, chiming in on those questions. Uh, if we didn't get to your question here, uh, just for time's sake, uh, we I will jump in and, and help answer those in the comments section to get you guys some answers. But, uh, but for the most part, Annika, thank you so much for this presentation uh, and all the research that you have done here at the nursery and just for science in general. Um, I think this is really gonna help people uh, and everyone start to understand the world around them. And oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate um, Tree of Life has been a, a great, uh, a great collaborator in this in this work. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing it throughout the year. Um, and check out uh, cesandiego.ucanr.edu uh, for information on uh, integrated pest management, uh, gardening. Um, we don't really have any native garden material specifically. So maybe talk to Tree of Life for that. Um, but it's got a ton of resources, um, just about any sort of any sort of home and ag thing you could imagine. So definitely check that out. Okay, all right, thank you guys all. Uh, we're gonna be trying to do these workshops more often. Uh, I think what, what our goal, what we're doing now is we're gonna do every other week. Uh, we wanna bring some real high quality uh, workshops to you. So, and we have mobile capability and we'll try to bring a lot more uh, workshops your way. If you have any suggestions for things you would like as far as the type of workshop you would like to see, uh, let us know in the comments section here or on social media and uh, or come down to the nursery and let us know. We are open. We are asking everyone to mind social distancing and everything like that. And we're taking all the precautions for sterilizing and uh, everything we need to do. But we're in a nice open atmosphere, as you can see behind me. Uh, so we are open. And um, so come get your native plants and talk to us about plants and, and uh, pollinator interactions. So Again, Annika, thank you for all your help and, and all your research.